Hi, everybody. Welcome. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but I think we've got everything functional now. Uh, so welcome to our in-person audience and to our Zoom audience. I want to introduce our speakers for today, but remember that we will also have events uh, each Thursday except Thanksgiving this quarter, and I will have schedules at the back if you want to pick up a schedule. Uh, today we have two speakers. We have Matthew Dames, Matthew Dames is a sword making expert, not a blacksmith, just your typical polymath and on hiatus English grad student, I know how that goes, uh, who knows a lot about weapons and traditional combat techniques from various cultures. And we have Clint Hull. Clint Hull teaches English at LCC. He is a student of rhetoric, communication, literature, and film, and has always been fascinated with learning about how and why people think. So please welcome Matthew and Clint. Thanks, everybody. So for a long time, I've been really interested in things like historical weapons, uh, mass battles, uh, components of history, things like that. You know, the kinds of, thing, kinds of things you'd expect a typical kid my age into nerdy stuff like that, like nerdy neckbeard stuff to be into. And there's all kinds of fiction media that has been built up around that trend. For ever since there has been cinema, really, there's been all kinds of representation for sword fighting and swords and their use and their making. And even before cinema, there was things like stage combat, arguably going as far back as the Greeks and their mystery plays. Because of that, however, there is a certain set of ideas that has kind of become embedded in the way we think about, the way we relate to or understand these weapons, their historical use and context. And there has been a growth of misconception about the way these weapons were used. One common misconception typically is that these weapons were heavy, and especially with European blades, they're heavy, they're slow, and you needed to swing with a lot of power to deliver a cut. For example, in the movie Conan the Barbarian, there's a really interesting fight scene where that really illustrates this point. And fair warning for folks watching the video on this presentation, there will be some scenes with some graphic violence, although um, nothing, no, no real violence, just uh, theatrical violence. So as you're watching this, note the overly choreographed, slow nature of the strokes. And think about other stage combats in This is another common image that held clash like this where the two blades bind and they don't really do anything. So that wasn't terrible as far as misconceptions go. There's, there were a few real, what we would call in the technical terminology, wards that both combatants took. And given that this is kind of a fantasy setting, there are some things that we can give a little bit of a pass. Even though it's live action, it's, it has the appearance of reality, has a certain level of mimesis going on. We still kind of understand that even the visuals 
are fiction to a certain degree. And it's even easier to see that separation between fiction and reality in things that are not live action in animated or cartoon or other stylized depictions like that. So this is our transition into Rurin Kenshin, an animated sword fight. This especially was a show that I loved as a kid, as goofy as it is. You just got five guys with one swing. It must be magic. Must be magic. <laughs> nope. Keep hitting the wrong button and tell me at full screen. So these kinds of anime and other cartoon depictions are clearly not real. You know, we recognize that this is not a, a depiction of real life, um, like a recording of real life action. But as we find ourselves wrapped up in any story, if the story is well written, it's going to feel similar to our experience of reality. Um, <clears throat> Ursula Le Guin talks about this in her introduction to The Left Hand of Darkness, that we kind of become temporarily insane, bonkers, as we're reading a story because we're believing it as we're reading it. That's what. Um, uh, scholars call the willing suspension of disbelief. And these excessively fantastic depictions, if they're done well, they take advantage of what the uh, tropes, um, tvtropes.org calls the rule of cool. If it's cool, then we'll kind of overlook the, the uh, unrealistic elements, right? Uh, to get us to accept the outlandish within the story context. When we stop to think about it, we know it's not real, but it can still influence our subconscious beliefs because of the way that our brains work. So when we're dealing again with over the top depictions or really stylized things like what we just saw where they even lampshaded or call it out a little bit when one of the characters actually says, oh, wow, it's like magic. I'm, yes, it, it is. It's obviously unrealistic. That's kind of the point of the story, especially if you watch that anime in more detail, you will see just how fantastic it really gets. So because of that animated style and other fantastic elements of that, it's really easy to see how even the super fantastic elements, you know, we know they're not reality. It makes it easy for us mentally, subconsciously to keep those two compartmentalized. Where things get sticky, is in live action depictions that are a little bit more grounded, kind of like what we saw with the Conan clip. There's another example that we're going to show you, which is a much more well-known one today. It's the crazy 88 fight scene in Tarantino's Kill Bill. Note again the heavy, slow, two-handed overswing, the overcommitment you start. Like swinging a baseball bat. Yep. And, you know, the end of that clip. So that is obviously over the top. It's wild it's nuts uh she but she only got uh she only got what three guys with one swing instead of five uh, a little less crazy than what we saw in the animated short clip there but still kind of wild and unrealistic and there are certain things tarantino put in that film certain ways that he framed the shots and that that last bit at the end there it's more of, a, more of a romantic than a realistic depiction. Bingo. Yes, actually, the, the romantics versus the realists is actually a really relevant point to bring up here. That is more of a stylized depiction, even in the live action content. Again, it's the kind of thing that we can separate out reality from fiction when we're watching. Maybe not as easily as with the anime, but with that we can. Notice, however, 
in the next clip, it's going to be really short and they're going to use more or less correct swordsmanship and it's going to look really real. But there are certain things about that that you should pay attention to when we roll the clip. This is a scene from Highlanders, the parking lot fight near the uh, beginning of the film. So he's gonna use a real technique here called the ukanagashi where he blocks and sheds the blow and follows up with the stroke. Real kenjutsu. It's actually real kenjutsu, even if it was a little sloppily performed. So let's just watch how he deflects the attack and lets it slide off his blade where he creates a kind of roof over his head. Again, real technique, but look at where that sword is at the end. That goes about two inches into that concrete pillar. So a little bit later, we're gonna talk exactly about some details about sword forging, particularly how that sword would have been forged. But the, sh the, the long and short of it is, a sword like that is not going to cut concrete. The edge is going to be brittle. It is going to be hard at about 30 Rockwell hardness, that con maybe 50, that concrete pillar is gonna be 75 plus. It's not going through even a quarter of an inch of concrete. It's going to chip the blade or nick the blade and leave the weapon damaged to where it's going to need repair. It's certainly not gonna cut through it, especially not after dispatching an opponent the way he did, which even then would require a very clean cut, very precise edge alignment and a well-maintained tool. Maybe even a little bit of luck. Maybe even a little bit of luck, especially if they're both moving around the real randomness and chaotic of chaotic nature of combat. It's extraordinarily difficult, not impossible, to see a cut like that. Now, that clip was short. It was after the fashion of the filmmaking of that era. It was raw and a little bit brutal. And seemingly much more grounded, the kind of thing that is much easier to accept than Tarantino's Kill Bill or something we might see in a cartoon. So something like a sword cutting a couple inches into concrete, well, maybe if it's really sharp and it's really well made, it seems like it could be plausible to your average person. Unless you know what Rockwell hardness is and you know exactly how these swords were made, what temperature they were brought up to in the forging process, chances are you're not gonna catch something like that. And that is not the last we will see in media of swords doing things they should not be able to do. What is a little bit disturbing though, is the next place we see them behaving that way. Right, because what if we leave fiction and go into what we think is reality Right. I mean, we have uh, real examples of people actually trying things with real swords and testing them out and seeing what happens. Um, shows like Mythbusters that set the gold standard for examining myths and, and trying to approach questions scientifically to try to arrive at more reliable results to distinguish the truth from the falsehoods. So here's an example of a show that emulates that Mythbuster formula. Yeah. That yeah, Mail Call, which was another show that I really enjoyed as a kid because it was, again, a kind of documentary style focus on ancient weapons or more modern military technology. It was just kind of one of those feel good programs. And they did the whole slow motion camera, the testing of different things, comparative experimentation, following the very successful formula and format of Mythbusters. It was one of the reasons why I liked it so much. And we're going to examine one of those clips now. So, which is the better can Not a real classy can opener. It did do some damage. It did what it's supposed to do. 
The long sword packed a punch and made a small hole. But other than that, not much impact on the arm. Let's get around the other side and try the uh, samurai sword. Yes, sir. Wow, then you cut that armor in half. We got a lot more penetration. Yes, sir, we did. And we want a good half inch in. Okay. Yes, sir. So there we have it. This samurai sword beats out the long sword again. Side by side, you can see the shorter steel blade of the katana doesn't flex as much as the long sword and penetrates deeper through the armor. So, we've got scientific experimentation. We're comparing these two results of an experiment. We're gathering evidence because the whole point of this clip, as you might have guessed, is to kind of compare how these weapons that never really met historically, except in very rare occasions and never actually in real serious combat, as far as we know, they, this is an attempt to see how they might stack up hypothetically if they were ever to meet in those circumstances. One of those kind of interesting who would win questions. The trouble is, Everything you just watched was BS. <laughs> this is supposed to be nonfiction, and it arguably is nonfiction, just not very trustworthy nonfiction. Because the reality is, neither of those swords are going to do anything to real armor. So this isn't even fiction. This is real content. They're telling, they're presenting themselves as though they are telling you the truth, giving you accurate information about what is on screen. They even had a sword expert there advising the presenter, Arlie Ermey, about exactly what to do, how to swing the sword, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought that line that he said was interesting. It did what it's supposed to do. It turns out those swords against real armor would not make even a tiny dent. They certainly wouldn't punch a hole through plate harness. That's, it's just not going to happen. Kind what, of do you, like what, how, what do you mean by real armor though, Matt? Weren't we watching this depiction of them attacking a piece of real armor? So, that armor looked like aluminum to me. Uh, I've heard other people derisively describe it as costume armor. And the way- It was way pretty thin though, wasn't it? It was extraordinarily thin. And the way it flexed when it got hit in the side, when the sword was being swung like a baseball bat, uh, again, it, real armor wouldn't react that way. It, it just wouldn't. So, this kind of content, it's one thing when misconceptions form around fiction that uses artistic license to try and entertain the audience. However, now we're making arguments about reality. And we are, with those arguments, building upon those misconceptions, legitimizing the kinds of scenes we saw earlier, like in Highlander, where that sword went through the concrete pillar or legitimizing a lot of that heavy, goofy overswing that we saw in some of these other clips. And at that point, it kind of even starts to blur the line of reality between what we're even seeing in those clips versus what we're seeing in the animated clip that you saw earlier. Those things get past our cheater detection mechanisms in ways fiction wouldn't. It kind of, to use, to use a phrase that Sam Harris would use, it's really good at gaming our wetware to just get us to accept things without critically examining them. 
Yeah, and, and the, uh, the documentary framing here, the way in which this is shot, the way in which the speakers are talking about the subject, um, these are drawing upon our sort of culturally, um, our cultural awareness of the language of, of this kind of film in order to build a, a certain layer of credibility around uh, what they're presenting to us. This is the kind of thing that we examine in the introduction to film studies class that we offer um, next quarter English uh, 215. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then that, as Matt was saying, that predisposes us to accept these things as true. And that gets past our teeter detection mechanisms that we've evolved. So, a lot of these bad ideas about how these sorts perform are related to further bad ideas about how they were made. So there's basically two major separate methods of sword forging that are going on here. Because the furnaces of the, the feudal era of Japan were never quite capable of bringing the metal temperature up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit plus they couldn't ever fully melt them and forge them and spring temper them in the way European blades were typically done. What that meant was that they needed another way to remove the impurities and they needed another way to add a particular impurity known as carbon to the iron ore to make steel. And they did. They had a method of folding the steel, literally the piece of metal, a piece of ore that would become the blade would be folded and then hammered back out and folded and then hammered back out again. And they do this many, 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 many times over and over and over again to more or less hammer out the impurities and evenly distribute the carbon among the blade so that it could have a kind of uniform strength. They would do something known as differential hardening in order to give the blade a cutting edge that would maintain itself through repeated use because a soft cutting edge is going to deform very, very easily. So what they would do is they would put some clay on one half of the blade lengthwise after, and they do so in a certain formation, which would produce the wavy hamon line that katana are so often known for that part of their iconic image. So the soft steel of the blade would be in the spine, which would allow it to flex without breaking. And the hardened edge would retain its sharpness so it'd be able to cut. So for spring tempering, you would have a European blade that you could flex and it would just snap right back into position. That's why in the mail call clip, you did see, as they noted, the European blade flexed a lot more, but it does that so it can come back into position without needing to be bent back into position and increase metal fatigue on the weapon, mean, making it more likely to break sooner. Also, there is, due to these bad myths surrounding the forging process, particularly the folding of steel, there was this idea that somehow the blade was made lighter. Uh, well, they, they are light relative to a lot of other weapons, but so is the European sword that is often seen as like this heavy thing meant to be swung around like a club. They're just as nimble, just as light in the hand as your typical katana would be. <clears throat> so these weapons were not designed to be ran through armor or to put dents in armor to make it easier to do damage to the human inside. They weren't even really meant to be used on the battlefield in the first place, at least not as a primary resort. The most common battlefield implements were always what we were use a general term to refer to as a pole arm, which would be something like a spear, a glaive, a halberd, a bill hook, et cetera, et cetera. A weapon on the end of a pole. Exactly. Typically, you would see this alongside a shield, the infamous spear and shield combo, which made and broke empires since, really, we've been recording history. 
people did carry swords. They carried European long swords on their side or katana, things like that. They did carry them into the battlefield, but they wore them on their side. They would only resort to those things if their polearm or their bow, in the case of the samurai typically, broke or they dropped it or they ran out of arrows or whatever. If they found themselves without their primary fighting weapon, they would draw those swords. Because those pole arms, what they were good at, because they were long, they had great leverage, they were excellent for rattling the human inside the armor. Something that a sword isn't really capable of doing, at least not for the most part. You're going to hit the armor, it's going to glance or bounce off. But a big heavy pole arm, it's going to do some impact damage even through that metal and gambeson and voider protection that they're often covered in. So <clears throat> when these weapons were drawn, when people on the battlefield did need to resort to them, they had to get clever. They had to do certain very specific things because the people they were trying to fight were wearing armor, which is really annoying when you're trying to cut at somebody with a sharp edge that otherwise will not carry much blunt trauma. So each of these respective cultures, what they did was they used those weapons in such a way to take advantage of their specialized make. So the Europeans, they had a technique called half sorting where you would actually, I kid you not, grab the blade about halfway up its length. So that way you could stiffen that formerly flexible tip and make it, more, make it much easier to guide under the seam of an armor or through voiders to get at the human inside. Now, what is known as tose gusoku or just the essentially the plate armor of the feudal era, the Sengoku Jidai of Japan, that had certain specific openings in order to make it easier to move. And the curved edge of the katana, which would enhance the cutting physics, the, the blow giving physics of the blade, they used that to take advantage of those openings. And we have, again, some examples for you to look at. So the next thing we're going to show is how a long sword would have actually been used against someone with armor. And it's going to go by fast, like it would have in real life. So pay close attention to this. We'll play that one more time, but look at the difference between the guy who's raising the sword way up over his head and bashing with it versus the guy who's using the sword and half sorting more nimbly. Yes, and this is actual recorded free sparring. This is not choreographed. And there is under the board and So that's how they would have actually used a sword like that on the battlefield if they had to draw it. There were different ways of using these weapons in a more civilian context, what back in medieval Germany would have been called Blasfechten or blouse fighting, which is kind of a euphemism for unarmored fighting. Because you can't just run up on somebody if he's got a sword and you're not wearing armor. That's really risky. So instead, they developed other techniques designed to use the sword as a shield and a weapon at the same time. And this is choreographed, but it's more real in many ways than a lot of what you have seen so far. Yeah, because they're choreographing the real techniques that they would use. Yes, all of these come from actual treatises or manual sources that people have been using to reconstruct these martial arts for about 25 years now. No over swinging, always getting threat with point or edge, always keeping the strong, close point of the sword for their, their own body while keeping the, the latter half of the blade toward their opponent. 
Watch how they blind on each other's blades whenever they get into a bind. They don't stay there for more than an instant, unlike what you'll typically see in a lot of college depictions. They don't hold there and exchange words or follow up with a kick. They immediately start jockeying for position. And notice when he gets it close, because that's another thing half sorting was used for, things didn't come to grips like that. Then you, if you have a weapon that long, you need a means of shortening it so you can be more precise in your movements. That was another purpose for the half sorting technique. It wasn't as common in Blast Vectin, but you did still see it happen. So that's how those weapons would have actually been used and as choreographed and as pretty as that was, it is arguably much more real than even what we saw in the Conan clip. So these next two clips are from the oldest school of martial art to ever come out of Japan, Tenshin Shoden Katori Shintori, which is the divinely inspired technique of the Katori Shrine. And this is the first sword form of that school. If YouTube will let us play it. <laughs> Take a moment to buffer, I guess. There we go. Come on. This is not free sparring. This is actual instruction that has been recorded live. So again, quick, precise movements, no overswinging. And this, the next part of the video, the rest of the video is actually the instructor for the school, the Shihan, breaking down the components of the first sword form and explaining what each technique's use is against armor. There's one in particular that we want to take a look at. So that right there, that first stroke down to the leg, he's receiving that blow on an armored component of his leg, something that he doesn't have to worry about protecting with his sword, because these techniques were made for the battlefield, not for civilian use. So they're taking that context into account when they do this. So because he's going to cut to the leg, his upper arm, the underside of his forearm is exposed because this part of the body wouldn't have been armored back in the day. So what he does then, yeah, once the opponent on the left is exposing that forearm, the opponent on the right is uh, taking advantage of that. Yes. So now he's going to give a blow to the arm, and then he drags the blade through to finish the cut. So he's taking advantage of both the katana's geometry and its construction, and the unarmored vulnerabilities that that armor still has. Both of these weapons the and the techniques that were developed to be used with them are perfect answers to battlefield threats, unless you, know, you have a pole arm and that's an even more perfect answer. But otherwise, if you're in a pinch, it's a really good response, each one of them, to the battlefield context that they would have seen in their day and age. Should we watch the first 20 seconds one more time? Sure. So now, what you, now that you know that, you can see where these points might have been unarmored, like the throat, the foot, the foot, and this section on the stomach that needs to be left free at the waist to allow them to bend. I'll go back to the other tab now. <clears throat> so over the last 10, 15 years or so, there have been a lot of experts that have been made through education, through personal practice, and really through a lot of rediscovery of some of the historicity surrounding these weapons and their use. And they have kind of launched this unofficial campaign 
to educate the masses through a lot of free resources about these weapons and their historical use, because a lot of people have always been interested in this stuff, like me. So these are fantastic resources for anyone who is interested in this sort of thing. So one, a couple of common set of myths that we've danced around here so far, but haven't really explicitly spelled out, <laughs> is that these European blades were super heavy, kind of dull, and therefore needed to be swung with a lot of impact in order to really see anything done, or that some swords, mostly katanas, but people said this about certain European blades too, like the rapier, were capable of doing things like piercing through plate armor or, or with side cuts, leaving dents in armor, or if you were like me when I was a really young kid thinking that even wooden swords could shear through metal. We may or may not talk about that later. So they, one of the things that they did is they dealt with a lot of these misconceptions early on, back in, as far as like 2010. And the, one of the main places they did this was a lot of free online platforms like YouTube or Vimeo, where they put up all these videos demonstrating and explaining exactly how these weapons would have been used, what they were actually capable of, basically doing what Mail Call purported to do, only this time they got it right, because a lot of these people are very educated in these subjects. One of them, uh, another expert by the name of Matt Easton that put out another video about this subject only a few years ago, recently comparatively, He's got a big degree in archaeology. He's done work at the infamous Sutton Who dig site. So these people have credentials. And again, Matt Easton and others of his ilk have been doing Olympic fencing and other swordsmanship and other martial art for 10 plus years. They know what they're talking about. So when these people made these videos, though, and educated the public, something fascinating happened something that I don't think I've ever actually seen before anywhere else, at least not personally. They, the, their audience came away understanding, okay, our previous notions about swords and swordsmanship and how this all works is, has been fixed, right? It's clear we know how these things actually work now. We know that European blades are really, really great. They're super fast. They can cut and thrust just as good or better than a katana. Not true, by the way. Katana is one of the best cutting blades in the world because of its edge geometry. And that the katana is this terrible sword that's very likely to break and the edge is going to chip into massive chunks and it's super hard to maintain. Also not true. So these experts, they put out a bunch of accurate, trustworthy, valuable information from their years, from their decades of education and experience on the subject. And their audience walked away misinformed. How did that happen? So the, the misinformation, as I understand it, was once their, once their misconceptions were cleared up, because the experts were focusing on, on all of the uh, debunking of uh, how wonderful, for example, Japanese swords were, they drew the opposite conclusion, that they must be terrible, right? Yes. And so because they're getting incomplete information, because the focus of these presentations was on the debunking, on the, on the refutation, rather than looking at both sides of, of the weaknesses and strengths of these weapons, um, people jumped to the wrong conclusion. How did that happen? Well, that brings us to talking about the nature of belief. Um, as Matt and I were putting this presentation together, we had a lot of conversations around how people think and why. This, this notion of how we form beliefs and how our beliefs persist, these are functions of our evolution as a social species. Uh, we're not unique in, in being a social species, of course, but 
like other social species, we rely upon other individuals of our species for our survival and to thrive. And we're unique in that we use symbolic language. We are able to communicate things to each other about things that happened in um, remote locations in time and space. For example, if my wife comes home from work and tells me a story about what happened at work, I don't have to be there witnessing the events to be able to recreate that in my mind because of our capabilities as human beings, I can get a pretty full and complete picture in my imagination of what happened through her words. Cross reference to what we said earlier about the depictions of swordsmanship in media. <clears throat> but our genes dispose us, predispose us to think socially rather than rationally. When we form beliefs, because of how we've evolved as a species, we tend to default to believing what other people believe. Because if we don't, if we're the outlier, that's a threat to our survival. Now think about the prehistoric environment where if you were the, the one person disagreeing with everybody else, you were less likely to get cooperation from everybody else. And that is a, is a legitimate threat to your survival. And there are selection pressures that therefore predispose us not to at least profess those beliefs, if not hold those beliefs. Um, so errors of reasoning in, in humans are common and they're communal. Thinking critically, thinking scientifically is hard because it's not natural to us. It's a skill we have to learn and practice, right? What's natural is thinking along with the crowd. And so it often takes courage to think critically. It's hard to question our beliefs, particularly when questioning a belief carries those social risks. Like, um, for example, Matt had to face when he was having his uh, theory of the wooden sword debunked. I had to bring that up. <laughs> so there was another anime that I enjoyed watching called Outlaw Star. There was this assassin character in it named Twilight Sasuka, and she carried a wooden sword, and she used that to do things like slash through cars on the freeway while she was trying to get at one of her marks and do other like super crazy things. Uh, and understand, I was very young when I watched this, so... It was easy for young me to believe that something like that would happen. And I kind of grew up just because I didn't have access to the internet at the time or an expert thinking that that could at least on some level be possible, right? Until I ran into somebody eventually that knew a lot more about the subject than I did. And I did not receive gentle correction. I thought the person that I was talking to was a moron. I was the moron. I, I, I was the one who was very misinformed about certain, like even just basic questions of physics about how these things worked. And it wouldn't be until like at least a year after that encounter that I would start to question some of the things I thought I knew about these weapons. And as I was doing so, I thought back to that conversation I had. I know maybe, maybe this other person who told me very different things than what I thought I knew about swords, maybe that person was actually right, at least about some things, maybe not everything, right about some things. As it turns out, that individual is right about pretty much everything he told me. So it sounds to me, it sounds to me Returning back to the selection pressures for a moment, like those who were more likely already predisposed to believe collectively were the ones who were more likely to be successful and thus pass on their genes and produce children who in turn were, would be more likely to believe collectively and so on and so forth, which kind of filtered out the mavericks, sort of. Yeah, and this is kind of the nature of scientific revolutions too. Uh, even scientists tend to fall into these patterns of thinking and have a hard time changing those patterns, even when confronted with extensive reasoning and evidence to convince them uh, to the contrary. It's not until enough people start to accept those kinds of seemingly radical or maverick theories that there becomes enough social pressure to be able to make those changes. It, it actually, it makes me think of the, I know this is a little bit off the topic of swordsmanship, but it reminds me of Adrian Semmelweis, if anyone here 
is familiar with that name. Uh, Joseph Lister kind of gets the credit for coming up with hand wash, yes? Yes, that guy. Yes, thank you. Repeat the name. Uh, Ignaz Semmelweis. Uh, Ignaz Semmelweis, yeah. Um, he's the guy who actually came up with the notion of hand washing, specifically hand washing and alcohol. Like soap wasn't until later. But at the time, the medical community really attacked him for what he was saying, what he was trying to do. But any physician that followed his practice, particularly physicians who were handling childbirth, saw a significant drop in mortality rate among both the children being born and the mothers. So there was a copious amount of evidence showing that the methods worked, but he still got blackballed by the medical community. And if I recall, ended his days in a mental institution. So he was right. He knew the truth and he was trying to get that information out there to help people. Arguably matters much more than swordsmanship, especially in this day and age. And that was what he was met with in response. So why are we talking about swords today anyway, Matt? <laughs> Isn't this sort of an archaic, esoteric, irrelevant topic? Well, I like swords. <laughs> they're, I think they're cool. I think they're fun to play with uh, in a safe way, of course. Um, they're also easy to talk about. They're not hand washing in the 1800s. There is at least a little bit of built in critical distance between the people talking about it and the subject. So we don't have to get as emotionally invested in that topic when we're asking questions like, how do we actually know what we know? Is what we actually know true or not? Those are hard questions to ask, typically. Easy to ask about something like this. Depending on where you are, there's obviously certain places you can go on the internet where you can see neckbeards fighting it out on various fora and getting into flame wars about the exact nature of these weapons and how they work. Yes, that still happens. You mean people remain people no matter where they are? Shocker. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, it, it reminds me of a, a related anecdote of the um, famous interracial kiss between Kirk and Uhura in uh, Star Trek, the original series, right? Where there were socio-political things happening around the 1960s and, and people still debating the question of whether interracial marriage would be an acceptable thing. <clears throat> so rather than addressing this directly where people were very hot and emotional and, and thinking socially about that issue, we remove that from its context and put it in a science fictional context. And in fact, we don't even see her and Kirk's lips meet on the screen in this scene, but you know, positioning suggests that they are kissing. And it's not even them, it's two aliens who are possessing their bodies temporarily who are, in, who are engaging in this sort of a kiss. But it's, it's a, a subtle and less um, defenses raising emotionally charged way of, of raising the issue and examining that point. We could have picked another issue. Like gun control, for example or abortion, <laughs> or any other hot button topic that people argue about and fight over sometimes physically today. But if we had done that, then as we proceeded through the presentation, making various assertions, we would have lost members of the audience as they either agreed or disagreed with us. It's one reason why even now we're going to keep our positions on those cleverly neutral, so. <laughs> So even though evidence-based scientific thinking is not natural and it's hard, it's essential for arriving at the most reliable conclusions and the most productive answers to the problems we all face, individually and collectively. So it's well worth the effort to sharpen our critical thinking skills if we wish to forge a well-functioning society. Clever. Thank you, everybody. We'll be happy to take your questions. I'm going to come over with the microphone so it picks up on the recording. Um, 
there's this episode of CSI Miami where the guy's riding a motorcycle and he cuts the guy in two through the middle with the katana. Is yeah. that realistic? That is a fantastic and interesting question and fantastic and interesting use of the word realism. Uh, is it possible? Oh, there's a good there's a good word possible because when Matt and I were just developing this presentation, we hit upon this idea of what's possible versus what's plausible, and different depictions will grapple with those factors in different ways. Yeah. So, uh, is it possible? I haven't seen that episode of CSI Miami. Just based on the image that I have in my head from what you described. I suspect, yes, it is possible. Uh, even if the motorcycle rider was wearing a lot of thick, heavy clothing, there's a fair chance, especially if they're coming at each other like this with all that extra Well, the one guy standing there and the guy on the motorcycle is the one with the sword. But, uh, but a high velocity strike, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it, it probably could. It's, it's possible. Um, something like that in reality is probably going to be very difficult to pull off, not impossible. But what especially interested me about your question was your use of the word realistic, because that is, that, that's a word that gets used a lot in reference to fiction. And I tried to stay away from it as much as possible during the presentation until now for that very specific reason, because the word realistic as it gets used colloquially is often a designator by the user of that word for what they understand to be plausible about reality. There's actually an interesting entry on TV tropes about this called reality is unrealistic. It's kind of the flip side to what we've been discussing where you can show somebody something real, like real live recorded footage. And depending on what assumptions they're bringing to their own viewing, what background education and experience that they have, they may or may not judge the real thing they're seeing to be realistic. So I've, I've got an, an anecdote related to that, actually, that we talked about earlier. Uh, when I was a, a, I think a sophomore in uh, college going to Central Washington University, I was staying in the dorms and we would have movie nights every weekend. Well, one of those weekends we were watching Remo Williams, The Adventure Begins. And there's a scene in that movie where uh, one of our protagonists is uh, careening down a hillside in a truck who's lost its brakes. And the truck hits a sort of a, an embankment and, and crashes and, and you know, crunch. And one of my uh, one of my fellow dorm mates, a uh, young woman, kind of turned to the rest of us and, and said, with with mild shock, "It didn't explode." <laughs> and I just have to laugh remembering that because that tells me that her experience of reality is when cars crash, especially in film, they blow up, <laughs> and that 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 uh, violated her presumption of how how that. Uh, uh, how fuel tanks and cars work. So I, I hope we answered your question sufficiently. Uh, just to follow up on that a little bit. Uh, so I get a lot of questions as a history instructor about historical fiction. Is this realistic? I said, well, <laughs> I mean, first, nobody's got smallpox scars and all their teeth are falling out. So no, this is not realistic. Uh, but we don't want to see realism. We want to see the cars explode. We want to see pretty people in the past. And so we have our image of car explosions or, you know, gorgeous people with perfect skin and teeth mm -hmm. in the 1700s, where that very much would not have happened, but we don't want the either boring or less attractive forms of the past. It doesn't make for as good a story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I know we're running low on time here. So, well, thank you so much to Matthew and Clint for their presentation. And I got to say, I was super happy to see all of this come together. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> the uh, 